seems that anywhere you look these days, you can't help but hear that artificial intelligence is developing so quickly that it will make us obsolete. And we must augment ourselves in order to compete with robots on the job market. Just the other day, I saw a magazine cover that showed the logical progression from a Neanderthal, modern human, to a cyber-enhanced being with some mystery hardware strapped to her hairless head. That all brings up a question, when can I upload my brain into a computer? My lab works on interfaces with the nervous system. And whenever I get asked this question, which is at every dinner party, I can't help but wonder whether this is an ill-posed question. And what we should really be asking is when can my brain collaborate with a computer? Machine intelligence and human intelligence are fundamentally different. A task of folding a wrinkled sock takes seconds for an untrained human who is also eating cereal, talking on the phone, listening to the radio, while a highly trained robot will wrestle with a sock for a few minutes while doing absolutely nothing else. On the other hand, a trained human will spend a few minutes on an integral of a sine function multiplied by a polynomial, while a single, simple calculator can crank this out in a fraction of a second. The human brain and the machine brain are fundamentally different. Human brain is a generalist. A machine brain is a specialist. And this difference in operation lies in difference in hardware. The building block of machine brain is a transistor. It can switch billions of times per second, but is only connected to three neighbors. Building block of the nervous system is a neuron. It can do only about 1,000 operations per second, but it communicates with 6,000 neighbors at once. And trying to upload your brain with its 90 billion neurons into a machine requires simultaneous monitoring of a multitude of electrical, chemical, mechanical signals across trillions of synapses at the same time. Some say that this translates into an information density of about 100 petaflops, which is equivalent to about a few million of modern laptops. We, of course, have a few million laptops. Um, but the trick is that unlike your brain, which uh, fits into one head and consumes about 12 watts, a million laptops occupy a warehouse and consume some megawatts. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that we do not understand how this multitude of parallel signals and computations in your human brain translates into your human intelligence. Worse yet, we don't have the tools to find out. But don't get me wrong, uh, machines are incredibly powerful. Many of you may have used Google Maps and within Fraction of a second, machine spits out three alternate routes from point A to point B, and it can even help you find a tie takeout on the way. And this task will take minutes to days for your human brain. Yet, you consistently rely on human reviews to choose your tie takeout. <laughs> uh, when it comes to manual tasks in, such as pres uh, that are prescribed, for example, welding joints, fastening bolts, drilling holes, at a manufacturing plant, machine consistently outperforms a human in both quality, speed, and precision. But the problems arise when the machine breaks or simply encounters a joint that is misaligned and it needs to weld it. It turns out that at the most sophisticated manufacturing plants, machines are being tuned, calibrated, fixed, and trained by people. And it's the ability of human brain to quickly analyze complex environment, pick out patterns, make decisions, and perform a wide variety of seemingly disparate tasks at once is the strength of our brain. So on one hand, we have this compact generalist, human intelligence. On the other hand, we have this precise specialist, machine intelligence. And wouldn't it be great if these two types of intelligence could collaborate in a way that is more natural than typing words into a command line? In fact, our 
even in our imagination, the interface between human and machine intelligence is so poor that science fiction characters use verbal input to talk to machines. In Iron Man movies, for example, Tony Stark talks to super artificial in intelligence Jarvis in order to get help with calculations. Shouldn't Jarvis be a simple module in Tony's brain? Well, uh, it turns out we currently don't have any tools to connect to the human brain. But how come? Some of you may have seen videos of paralyzed persons controlling robotic arms with their brain signals. But that was in the lab on a highly prescribed task supervised by a team of PhDs. To give you a flavor of what happens in the real world, I'd like to tell you a story. I recently had a chance to sit in a panel with a science journalist, Miles O'Brien, who also happens to be a single arm amputee. And uh, Miles is a, one of the most well-known science nerds, and you would expect him to have access to most sophisticated prosthetic limbs. Yet he, just like many other single arm amputees, does not wear a prosthetic. It turns out that the most sophisticated artificial arms pale in comparison to your natural hardware. And what is missing is the interface to your nervous system. Simply put, those hands do not feel, nor do they move on a whim. And this problem is unsolved, despite the fact that in order to connect a prosthetic arm, you only need to communicate with a few million only uh, fibers in, your, in the peripheral nerves in your arm. Now imagine how this problem scales when we talk about trillions of synapses in your brain that some hope to upload into a computer. And the problem of the neural interface is not simply a problem of resolution. The differences between human computing hardware and artificial computing hardware come from biology, chemistry, and material science. Your brain is soft, squishy, and three-dimensional. Electronics that power modern computing and artificial intelligence are hard, rigid, sharp, and flat. And despite 30 years and billions of research dollars, machine-inspired brain interfaces continue to fail. And what we need is a brain-inspired machine interface. We need an interface that matches biology, chemistry, and mechanics of the nervous system that can match the resolution of individual synapses and that can communicate with neurons across all their natural languages, neurotransmitters, electric fields, mechanical forces, changes in pH, changes in temperature, and many others that we have not yet discovered. At the same time, this interface needs to be able to communicate back to the artificial hardware. And we do not have such an interface, but we are hard at work trying to get there. In our lab, we have developed nanotransducers that are a thousand times smaller than individual coffee grinds. They can be mixed into IV solution and injected into your brain just like a drug. There, they can receive signals from outside electronics and convert them into one of neuronal languages, for example, heat. Our colleagues are busy working on devices that can record from neurons and transmit those signals to outside electronics. Yet even with the most sophisticated hardware, we can only communicate with a few thousand neurons. We are orders of magnitude away from trillions of synapses. In the meantime, artificial intelligence is marching along and is developing much more quickly than the hardware required to interface with your entire brain. And it's likely going to be a missed opportunity to not take advantage of artificial intelligence as a specialist plug-in into your generalist brain. And this type of future 
is likely much, much closer than trying to develop a comprehensive understanding of every synapse in your brain. And even if we did develop such an interface, should we really spend energy on uploading this compact generalist into an army of specialist machines, a SOC folder, a joint welder, or a tie takeout reviewer? Wouldn't it be more efficient to, for example, add a specialist piano player or a GPS <coughs> unit to your uh, generalist brain? So one might wonder whether there is even space in our brain for all the information that artificial intelligence is capable of delivering and receiving. But did I mention that brain is not stationary? Those synapses are evolving. Brain is plastic, which means the wiring changes every time you learn a new skill. And this process will likely be accelerated by interfacing to the brain directly. And collaboration with artificial intelligence may not just deliver specialist knowledge or skills. This partial interface may make our own human brain even more powerful and uh, diverse generalist. So how can we get there? The lightning fast development of artificial intelligence is powered by ubiquitous computing. It's accessible to many, and it's very democratic. Development of the neural interface hardware, on the other hand, requires significant infrastructure, training, and investment. And it also requires a paradigm shift from machine-inspired electronics to biology-driven design of new materials and architectures. And we cannot simply outsource this task to a handful of academic labs. It will simply take too long. We already took 30 years. And if we take another 30, we will be missing an opportunity to gain a collaborator and a partner in artificial intelligence. So let's join forces with academia, industry, and government to accelerate the development and deployment of a neural interface such that our generalist human intelligence can collaborate with specialist artificial intelligence to do what it does best, create, analyze, and decide. <laughs>